Oh, sure. Um, my name's Sard Kate. I've been playing the game since uh, late 2006. I'm currently CEO of Gunpoint Diplomacy, which is a small pirate corporation, low sec PvP corporation based out of Molden Heath region in Eve. Um, I've been writing a blog on PvP, and more recently I have been um, doing a Eve PvP stream where I will live stream my efforts in game and occasionally use uh, recordings as well, trying to show off um, how I PvP in small gang and solo gang environments, as well as explaining how I do so, the tricks I'm doing so, fitting, etc. Um, I guess that's about it. Um, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> cool. How about your your history in Eve Online? Like, how how long have you been playing? How'd you start off, and so on and so forth? Have you been a PvPer this entire time? Let's see. I started PvPing about a year into the game. Uh, when I first started the game, I was totally into mining. Um, that kind of stopped after the corporation I was doing it with the buddies I was mining with uh, kind of split apart. So after that, I joined up with. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age um, led me into NPC uh, Nolsec gang PvP. It was uh, small to medium-sized gangs, really laid-back uh, corporation. Um, did that for about a little bit less than a year. And then from there, moved with the same group of people onto a new corporation, which was the Uninvited Guests, and uh, stayed with them for a l- little over a year. And within uh, those two groups, I really learned a lot of the basis which I used for my small gang experience. But uh, on the side, I was also watching a lot of E! videos. Um, I guess notably, the most notable of which that really affected my uh, drive to PvP, which was Kill 2's videos. And uh, part of that and, and a lot of the other videos I was watching, I decided to just give um, solo PvP a try. I decided to make my own corporation for this effort and uh, started Gunpoint Diplomacy. That was about three years ago. It's a little bit over three years, I believe. And um, I didn't really intend for the corporation to grow beyond even a couple of members, but uh, it just seems that um, my ideals and goals for the game really meshed with a lot of people that I was flying with and against in the area, so the corporation kind of grew and grew and grew, and right now we're up to about 40 people. Most of which right now are playing the uh, Arma Zombie mods, but that's summer slowed down for you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so again, this is um, an open Q and A. You're free to ask any questions that you like, especially about, um, you know, the primary topic is going to be um, solo and small gang PvP and pirating. And um, we're going to be using the same format as pretty much every other Q and A for those of you who are new to it. Um, please join the lecture.euni chat channel and then just post your questions in the lecture.euni chat channel. Please prefix your question with a Q colon, just in case, um, you know, there's a lot of questions all at once and I'll, uh, I might have to scroll back and look for, um, the older questions and it'll just, it'll just be a lot easier for me to spot your question if you pre- prefix it with Q colon and that way hopefully we won't accidentally skip yours. So yeah, feel free to, qu- to ask your questions. Time. Um, I'll be going through the questions themselves and and um, repeating them and posing them to Sard, and then he'll be answering them here on Mumble. So it looks like we we've got a first question from um, Texacal asks: When a fight seems to grow in front of you, what do you look for to decide if you should engage it or not? One thing I've um, I had a uh, viewer pose to me is that. Um, when I'm l- l- teaching what I'm doing, when I'm trying to explain to people what I'm doing, it's not so much explaining how to do something, but why I'm doing it. So, in light of that, a, a lot of what occurs in EPP is contextual. So, I um, I could give all of you a, a, say, a rupture fit. But the way that the rupture fit is going to be flown is going to really change depending on the opponents or the number of opponents or what kind of opponents that you're faced up against. So it's, it is really contextual when I see a fight growing, um, how I choose to whether or not to engage or how I'm going to engage or what kind of goal I have. But I think it really depends on what my goal is when I've started the fight, um, when I'm going into the fight. So let's say, again, going with that rupture, uh, I say I'm roaming into a path where I know that there are a lot of pirates that like to campicate. Um, 
what I like to usually do with ruptures is I like to take them into people that are gate camping, people that are pretty hungry for a fight, and try to string out their more vulnerable support ships, whether it be tacklers or it be recons, e-warships, and then string them out, either burning away from a gate or jumping through gates, get aggression on the, all their gang, and then isolate targets, and then just try to pick off whatever I want. But that's really... That's because the rupture can really just take down one cruiser-sized ship until its buffer is depleted with an armor um, plated uh, rupture. But conversely, if I'm in a um, active tanked armor BS, I might be trying to um, just run through um, a gang, just try to get them spread apart, and then get a bite-sized portions of the gang where I can engage parts, maybe. Uh, and then disengage, jump through, and continue the process. But again, it really is context- uh, contextual. Let's see. Livzabelle asks, how many skill points would you consider ideal to start solo PvP? For solo PvP, uh, gosh. It really depends on what you enjoy as far as PvP goes. Uh, if you enjoy frigate combat, I think you're pretty close to being good to starting PvP out of the box. But part of the problem with that, and part of the problem with solo PvP, is that to be, I think, really successful and be, have it be really enjoyable, um, you need to have some basic knowledge about the game and some experience to help you succeed in the game. So I don't think solo PvP necessarily is a good starting point for the game, so I'm not going to really say you know right out of the box, but I think you can start doing... Um, sold to PvP if you get a little bit of coaching or you had a little bit of prior knowledge from e-videos or something like that pretty quickly. And if I was to put a quantity on that, um, <laughs> I think I would just say, I guess, a couple of days out, out of the box, you can start throwing away ships at people. Cool. So yeah, just get out there as early as you can, or as early as you're comfortable. Uh, Ranger asks... As a new player, is there a particular race slash ship combo you would recommend to get started in solo slash small gang PvP? Ranger, um, I, I think we've been blessed recently with the latest Inferno patch, and j- right now, just now, we have every single race's frigate line becoming buffed. And in fact, I think the old standby would be, "Hey, get in a Rifter." That's no longer the case. In fact, I would say, "Hey, get in Merlin. Those things are awesome." Um, with the recent frigate changes, we have a very competitive, very, very effective um, frigate for every single race in T1, uh, T- Tech 1 class. So I, I think um, if, if it really comes down to it, you can get started in PvP if you enjoy frigate PvP pretty quickly with any race. You don't really have to worry about, you know, oh, if I keep on training, like, is, is it really going to be worthwhile? Um, but if you if you are really interested or you enjoy larger class ships, you know, cruisers, battle cruisers, battleships, you really should look at what kind of gameplay you enjoy in general. If you enjoy kind of support class, maybe you should look at um, maybe Kaldari. They have a lot of long range damage projection. They also have a lot of really strong E War. But if you like brawling, maybe you should look at say Amar or Galente. Those are two races that are very good for um, brawling. Okay, let's see. Anna asks, can you link your blog and or vid you made? Uh, I see that Tally's already linked Tally's the Twitch. Got, yeah, I'll link the um, the uh, blog. It's something I, I don't I haven't up, updated it since January of this year, but um, I'll, I'll um, quote it for um, the recording as well. It's www.evebroadside.blogspot.com. Um, more recently, I've just been posting uh, stream-related um, thoughts, comments, and I'm probably going to be posting within the next few weeks um, an, like an FAQ section for some frequently asked questions I get while streaming. So, I mean, I guess you can look out for that. Okay, and while he posts that, um, I totally forgot to mention that if you do wish to record this um, this Q&A, then feel free to do so. I see that a few people have already started recording. So um, those of you who have to leave early, um, no problem. Hopefully one of those people who have started a recording will be able to make it available for download after the Q&A is over. And there we go. There's the link to the to Eve Broadside at Blogspot. 
Okay, let's go ahead and move on then. Um, Algazel asks, is, is there a method you use for learning what to expect from the 300 plus ships in EVE? Algazel, I really like that question. I really, really like that question because I think it's one of the most difficult parts about this game is just the sheer massive scale of this game. And the fact that even if you know the basics of those 300 plus ships, if there are indeed 300 plus ships, it sounds like a kind of a sizable number. Um, the way that they can be flown can vary just inc- on a, such an incredible scale. Um, it's very hard to get an understanding of how one ship's going to be flown versus another ship, and then if you combine these ships, like how is that going to match up? And it's sort of why I think we all play this game. It's just that ability to change things up. And um, how did I go about doing that? I did a lot of looking in the market, looking at ships, looking at their abilities. I did a lot of asking around, asking um, more knowledgeable, experienced players, like, how, how, how do you fit this? How do you fly this? What's, what's normal? What's common? I did a lot of going to EVE community sites. Um, in the past, that was Scrap Heap Channel Challenge. I think now it's called Fail Heap Challenge. And I went to their fitting sections, kind of get an idea for how people are fitting them, how they're flying them, what their goals were, what they were trying to accomplish with their ships, what kind of gang sizes you saw particular ships. Um, also did a lot of tinkering in EVE Fitting Tool, which is a um, third-party utility for um, te- um, fitting ships, testing them, looking at their statistics. I think Pytha is uh, fitting tool is also a very common one these days. Did I really have a method for it? No, I was just incredibly curious about the game. And I, over the course of a couple of months, I accumulated some basic knowledge about how ships tend to be fit, um, what kind of tanks tend to go on them, what kind of damage mods or utility mods tend to go on them. And then after getting that basic knowledge, I spent the next couple of years getting an idea of how they're flown, what works really well, what doesn't work, trying to sort through the mess of information people gave me, whether it was good or bad information. And it's that knowledge that really allows me to make these snap decisions in uh, PvP, that which enabled me to win or come out as, quote-unquote, victorious in a fight. Let's see, Engen asks, Sometimes rooms can come up empty. What would you suggest to maintain a target-rich environment? That's also a really good question. Um, I think choosing what kind of region you're going to live in um, really does affect how your rooms are going to end up going. But... um, to kind of counter that, kind of counter the blind nature of, hey, let's go into Rome and just picking a destination. One of the key um, tools that I use in-game to determine where I should roam, when I should roam, so on, is using the map statistics. So if you open up your in-game map, um, let me do so and just kind of run through it, go through the um, world map control panel, click on the star map tab, on stars, and then go down to statistics. What I like to go through is um, just seeing the number of pilots in space in the last 30 minutes. That really gives me a basic idea of, okay, are there actually pilots active in space doing something at within the last 30 minutes? It'll give me an idea if there's actually a gang there, or if there's just a couple players there that are actually doing something in space. Another decent one would be the number of pilots currently docked and active. That'll give you an idea combined with the average pilots in space, the total number of pilots in that system. So they'll give you an idea if it's kind of a home system or if there's just a whole bunch of people. that Maybe you saw five pilots in space, but there's another 30 docked that, you know, maybe you can get a fight, but you have to be quick about it. Or else the person you're fighting is going to get a lot of reinforcements quickly. You can also get an idea through these, through these statistics, excuse me, whether or not there's a lot of NPCing going on. So if you want to look for perhaps pirating targets or ginking targets, whether or not there's a lot of PVE going on in an area, that sort of thing. I think it's important when you're picking a roam path to be intelligent about it and choosing paths that will fit with what your goal is for PvP, whether you're looking for a small gang fight, medium-sized large gang, solo, you name it. I think using the map statistics is the way to go. Excellent. Kieran Blackwing asks, which ships do you hate to come up against when you're out hunting? Um, I think recons and e-warships are really, really difficult to deal with when you're running around alone, solo. Um, they can present really good opportunities to pick off from a gang. So, I mean, it's it's not all bad, but 
whenever I'm, say, roaming around and I see, like, a small gang and then I see, like, a blackbird or a falcon, I tend to just move on. I, I tend to not think about the ways that I might be able to pick off that lone e-warship, maybe warp in at different ranges and catch the lone e-warship or catch a lone ship alone uh, by itself. Because I know the moment that ship gets onto the grid and starts asserting itself, it it really tends to be game over for the majority of ships that I like to fly. Um, it also tends to, to um, influence the way I fit a lot of my um, really aggressively flown solo ships, like my um, Gank Dominics I like to fly with the ECCM, or my Armor Tanked Hurricane that I like occasionally will take out solo. I, I like to fit those with ECCM. It really does affect the way I fly my ships. Uh, next to that, I think um, fast tackle or frigates in general tend to be a real huge problem. This is why I've recently ratted up my sex status. So if I want to fly in kind of an interestingly fit battlecruiser or battleship that, say, doesn't have a prop mod or doesn't have a webifier or doesn't have really the ability to deal with lighter class ships, um, having sentries on my side so I don't get caught by, say, a... Um, stream cheating or just lucky frigate pilot decides to tackle me in the gate, I'm not going to get caught by them without them taking sentry aggression. And it's it's it can be really frustrating if you're an outlaw and you have some frigate just tail, tailing you and pointing you on gates, either for his gain to come, um, come and um, assist him or just to grief you. It means you have to fly in ships that are capable of dealing with frigates, and that's not always what I want to do when I when I sit down to play this game. Let's see, Livesible asks... Oh, here we go. Uh, what made you start streaming your gameplay? So, I guess, um... When I was pretty much starting my senior year of college, which is, I think, early... Yeah, early 2011, um, I started watching a lot of game streams. I think I started with uh, StarCraft II. I watched a lot of that. Then I started moving on to other game streams, and I was like, I, I, thought, I thought it was really informative, informative, it was really helpful, it was also really enjoyable to watch people play a game. It sounds kind of odd, maybe voyeuristic, but um, it, it, it really replaced what I think a lot of people use television for, for just that entertainment value without having to really effort, right? So eventually, after watching months and months of these things and getting kind of antsy just to do my own thing, I decided, hey, you know, no one's doing this for EVE Online. I wonder if I could do that. And I sat down, I thought about it, I thought about what it would mean to my my gameplay, what it would mean to my enjoy, how I would enjoy the game, and honestly, I, I didn't really know if it would work out. I thought it, it wouldn't work out at all. And if you go to my blog, there is... Um, well, I guess it might be the January post um, explaining kind of like my expectations and then my finding that it was actually incredibly enjoyable, incredibly rewarding to do this. And um, so completely unexpectedly, I mean, I was expecting people just to use all that information against me. Um, but I found streaming to be incredibly enjoyable. I really like to have that kind of friend looking over your shoulder aspect to the game where I get to explain what I'm doing live to people, and I get questions posed right back to me, I get kind of a pat on the back, or just maybe people um, telling me the kind of things I'm doing wrong, whether I forgot to put drones in my drone bed, that sort of thing, or if I lose a fight, getting to explain to them, like, why I lost that fight, and then getting feedback, maybe I was wrong, and kind of learning more about the game that way. So I've really, it's really been an interesting experience that's still evolving, still growing. Um, It's also, I've always been pretty interested in the community that is um, that composes the EVE Online player base, and uh, it, it's nice to have an opportunity to, in my own unique way, um, contribute back to the EVE community. I've been doing that in a fashion with my blog, but I've never really been able to keep up with how I feel I should with the blog. I, I really enjoy um, writing about EVE Online, but the, um, the live stream has been a way for me to just sit down and immediately start um, composing material for people to watch and enjoy um, without kind of the effort that I felt I um, had to put in to write a blog post and you know put down a draft, edit it, maybe send it off to a friend for further editing or getting ideas for it, kind of having to brainstorm rather, where I could just log into game, 
turn a, a um, broadcasting utility on, start recording, and start being my, just be myself. It's a lot less effort to um, kind of have the same result of teaching people about how to um, go about enjoying this game um, while playing in a small game or a solo environment. Okay, and along those same lines, um, you know, related to your stream, other people have asked me outside of this chat, um, do you do do you do the stream on, on a schedule, or are there like certain times of the day or certain days of the week where you are more likely to do your stream if it's not on a regular schedule? Well, um, the stream, this, there's two components to why I do the stream. One is because I, you know I, I enjoy doing it, and two is because I enjoy the fact that other people enjoy doing it. So, I mean, I think I already have a pretty strong viewer base. Um, I mean, the moment I go up, I get about 65 to 70 people, and depending on whether, whether River Any will um, plug me for Eve News 24, I might have several hundred people watching me at a given time, which is really, really, really cool. So I already have that player base set up. Um, but I think the most important thing for when I, I start streaming, or if I decide to start streaming, is whether or not I really want to play the game and I'm really in the mood to enjoy the game. Because I don't want to broadcast something where I have some negative juju, whether it be from work or whatever, emotions going on. I, I want to, to broadcast an, an educational and enjoyable um, stream for people to watch. So, for example, lately I really haven't been doing a hell of a lot of streaming. and that, a, a lot of what that has to, to do with is the fact that there hasn't been um, the target selection that I, I feel is really warrants for me broadcasting gameplay. I realize there's a lot of people that just want to watch something for while they're mining or they're mission running, what what, what have you. But um, if I'm, my heart's not in it, and I know I'm not going to be finding much, if anything at all, for um, fights, I, I really don't feel like broadcasting events. But um, what I try to what I try to stick to, I try to stream at least three or more times a week. Um, I usually will broadcast. Um, pretty soon after I get home from work, which is um, about um, two or so hours from now, so that'd be um, around 2400 e um, Eve time, and for a couple hours after that, usually my stream sessions will go on for about two to three hours. Um, I don't think I could really stick with a, a set schedule. It's um, very difficult to maintain it on a... Um, Especially when I'm not really getting paid to do this, I don't. I don't really have anything back other than just the appreciation from the community, which is really what I do it for. But um, that's why I try to stick with about three times a week, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and about those times during the day when you get home from work. Yeah, Pacific time. That's about five, anywhere between five and nine p.m. Pacific, which is GMT minus eight, which I think is twenty-four. 100 Eve time, so, and then about five hours after that, so I'll be streaming about two to three hour duration. Um, more recently, and kind of to counter um, people that have been using my stream to cheat, I've been doing a, f a fair number of recordings. I don't really, I really prefer not to do that. I like the live interaction. I like to do it live, but um, if I'm doing something kind of interesting, say I'm flying like a no-prop ship, or I'm flying a battleship solo through low sec, it can be very difficult to get natural engagements that way. Um, one thing I will comment about is r doing a stream live can actually be a decent way to get fights in and of itself because there will be a lot. Of, there'll be a number of people that will just try to use that information. It's like, oh hey, let's go gank arcade, da, 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 go over there. Um, but given my experience with the game and my ability to um, match what people throw at me, and also the hurried nature of people that try to run these little gank squads. I tend to actually be able to get decent engagements out of it. But um, if I'm doing something kind of um, gimmicky, like running, again, like a, a no-prop ship or a solo battleship, there's only so much, so many trips, tricks you can pull in, until someone just um, uses their, their ace in the hole to knock you out. So I prefer to... I've been trying doing um, recorded broadcasts, which I feel is... About as bad, if not better, than doing, say, a stream delay, which would be delaying the broadcast by a couple, like a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes, and um, because it, it allows me to actually sit down, watching the broadcast with everyone else that's watching, and actually um, interact with the people that are watching through the um, stream chats to um, 
can almost get the same effect as doing it live, just without being able to converse verbally with um, the people that are watching. Excellent. And for those of you who are, are aren't that familiar with um, with Twitch TV, if you go to, over to Sard Cage channel, you can see his um, his older streams there as well. Just go to the videos tab, and you can watch those. Yeah, and in addition to that, there's also a uh, highlight set section that actually has, instead of the hour-long streaming sessions, I, I have um, highlighted fights, and I've also done commentaries on selected fights. I've also done kind of guest commentaries, um, notably with Wensley of uh, the Rifter Drifter. Um, so there's a lot of extra con- uh, content or kind of um, abridged content for those that don't want to sit down for hours and hours and then watching EVE online. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see, moving on. Uh, Sid Psycho asks, Would you recommend fleet PvP before doing solo PvP to get a sense of various ships' capabilities? I think it's good to have a mentor, a tutor, people to kind of give you an idea of how to play the game and kind of direct you when you are playing the game. Um, I know of very few individuals that just decide to do their own thing from the get-go and been successful. Very rare for that to happen. So yeah, I, I think it is a great idea to get into a uh, gang environment to um, learn PvP. But I don't think you have to go into super large gangs to get an idea. In fact, I think it's um, kind of a bad idea. It will stunt your growth if you go into, say, a large null psych alliance and um, only expose yourself to really large gang fights because it's very, very, very different from what you experience when you're doing even medium size, which is, I, I believe, about, to me, 50 people are smaller on each side to small gang and solo, which is like maybe 10 to 20 people or, you know, 5 to 10 or solos just alone. Um, what happens when you go to smaller and smaller gang sizes and gang formats it becomes much, much more important for individual members of a gang to understand what's going on in a fight, what their particular ships need to be doing in a fight, and carrying out at, on by themselves their um, their roles in the fight. Whereas when you're in a really, really large gang fight, you know, 50 to 100 people or more, it, it really just depends on that. You're following primaries, you're um, maneuvering where the FC tells you to maneuver. It's a lot less... Um, Engaging for the individual pilot, they, it's much more necessary for them to just follow FC orders. Whereas when you're in that small game, medium-sized game, or even solo environment, it really depends on individual pilots to carry the fight. Let's see. Patrick asks, "Are there any cloaky ships you enjoy PvP in?" So um, when I'm streaming. Um, what I'm trying to do is be quick, really fast, really aggressive fights that are enjoyable to present a um, really enjoyable PvP-rich um, medium for people to watch and enjoy. So cloaky combat doesn't tend to be brawling combat, so I tend to avoid it. Um, but regarding just PvP in general, um, I actually really I, I really like flying falcons. It may say, seem kind of odd, but... I, I really do enjoy that kind of aspect of do, um, going out and applying jammers and being that support role. It's a, it's not, it's kind of like relaxing for me to go out and do that. Um, aside from the Falcon, um, I've tried like a Blaster Razu maybe a year or two back. Um, it wasn't really my thing. I, I, I just can't stand Pilgrims. The gameplay that it's a, it's kind of a ganking gameplay, and it's not a very interesting one with that. Um, one thing I haven't really experienced or experimented with much would be um, using stealth bombers. I've had um, my corporation considering doing that when they were out um, visiting Providence. But, um, I think that might be something I want to try a little bit more. Stealth bombers and uh, Black Ops battleships. Not so much for the hot drop capacity, just for the um, surprise um, battleship ganking capacity in a fight. But um, generally, no, I, I really prefer brawling ships without the cloaks. Let's see. Party asks, do you have someone with a scan frig slash covops nearby to scan our targets and safe spots, or is that even needed? Okay. So when I first started um, my solo experiment out of um, gunpoint diplomacy, 
I was running around quite often in a um, Tech 1 battle cruiser, running around Molden Heath and uh, nearby regions, just looking for some fun, looking for some fights, kind of learning the ropes as far as um, solo PvP goes. And one of the most frustrating things, and I think this kind of goes back to um, roaming around and not finding any fights, would be that I, I would run past maybe half a dozen, dozen, you know, it just depends on the day, uh, of pilots that they were in a exploration site, they were in a mission, they're in a safe spot, they're they're being cowards, and I just couldn't get to them alone um, in my typical PvP ship. And if I was to fly in a, P a ship that could PvP and launch probes, well, there's there's very 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 limited number of ships that are capable of doing that, such as the Pilgrim, which I already mentioned, I <laughs> really despise flying. Um, so, I mean, it, it was really frustrating to have all these these PvP opportunities that I'd just have to pass on by. I wouldn't be able to take on. And so, and about a year afterwards, I, I decided to um, use the power of two deal, and I um, started an alt account, and pretty much immediately had him go into um, co-op stuff, as well as doing market stuff to make money. And... Um, I, I found immediately after that dual boxing, I, the PvP potential for a given roam, say around Molden Heath or um, nearby regions, was increased by 50% or even doubled just by going after targets that were doing their PvE sites or hiding in safe spots, what have you. It, it was really a boon. And um, if you really, really get into solo combat, I think having that extra alt... Um, really does help out a lot. I think most hardcore soloers aren't truly solo. They actually have an alt account that's doing a fair bit of scouting, probing, maybe running uh, gang links on the side um, to support them. Let's see. Judoret asks, can you explain the different practical pros and cons to fit Afterburner or Micro Warp Drive in solo PvP? Um... So I, I think I should um, preface my answer in that. This, you really see the, the question come up, should I fit Afterburner or Micro Warp Drive in PvP with frigates? You don't so much see it with larger ships. I think the um, exception to that that you will see with, is with very, very few uh, cruisers. Um, I'm going to leave out the whole oversized um, Afterburner um, theory and practice from this answer, but... Um, you see it occasionally with a signables and stabber fleet issues, and that's just because these ships are incredibly nimble and they have the mid slots to support um, a dual prop fitting. But um, with frigate combat, it really depends on where you're flying. It really depends on what you're trying to do with your frigate. Um, for example, if I'm flying in low sec, I'm trying to hunt other frigates. Um, to be competitive in an environment where most other frigates are using scramblers and weaponifiers, having an afterburner gives you mobility while scrambled to dictate range and either get in close if you're a close range fit or to keep range from others if you're in a um, kiting fit, which is incredibly valuable um, in frigate 1v1s or in fighting other frigates. Um, MWDs are also vi um, viable if you're in a really long-range kiting fit, something that's going to be hitting out to like 20 km, 15 km, something like that. It's outside of web range, so it's not like those are completely unviable. If you're going into, say, um, null sec, or you're doing, you're in a war deck and you're in high sec and you're trying to do some ta uh, being a tackler, um, I think it's incredibly viable if you're in, say, an interceptor and you're just trying to long point people to use an MWD and kind of buzz around your target outside of a range that they can really do anything to you. So having that speed is um, incredibly valuable. And then there are ships that do both. Um, I think a really popular dual prop frigate would be the Tyrannus. So it uses the MWD to kind of zoom around, either approach targets or move away from targets, kind of get into good spots, and then it, once it gets into an engagement, it gets scrambled, or if it just wants the speed taken up, up an opponent, it will just turn on its afterburner and have that really small signature radius to avoid hit, getting hit, as well as really good maneuverability within the scrambler web range to um, get into its ideal range, whether it's using antimatter void or it's using null. But um, yeah, again, it's, it's really... That's a question you see when you're flying frigates. I don't think it's something that you should really be considering if you're flying in 
battle cruisers, battleships, or even cruisers. There's only a very select number of cruisers that really benefit from using a afterburner MPP. Okay, let's see. Algazel asks, I've heard recommendations that people new to PvP start with T1 cruisers rather than T1 frigates. And what are your thoughts? And I think that, that um, might have stemmed from our previous open Q&A that we had um, with Kill T, where, where he was... Um, he was one of the people who who's recommending that. Um, I think I've been recommending to a lot of people that are, are asking about getting into PvP. Like, what what? How do I do it? What, what should I do? I have some friends that I want to do it. Like, what kind of gang should we do? And uh, one of the gang formats that I really like to push on people would be Tech One um, Cruisers. There's a couple of reasons for this. They tend to be they can, they ha, they can you can put decent buffers on them while maintaining a decent amount of um, gank output, so a decent amount of damage output with them. Um, they have okay range. They um, they can fit a decent amount of tackle. I think the most important part about flying around in a small gang of um, cruisers is that you can throw on a crap ton of ECM drones, or you can even put um, an EC uh, an E warship with your gang. Um, ECM drones in their cur- current um, way they currently work in, in the game are incredibly powerful. Uh, they take very little SP to use. You, you don't have drones or have really solid drone skills to use them. And they will take out ships in the, in the fight that have pilots that have you know over 100 uh, million SP for 20 seconds or even longer if you get j- consecutive jams with your ECM drones. So they're incredibly powerful. Um, I think it's a really, really solid option for running around in low sec or even null sec to do that. Um, but going back to cruisers versus frigates, it really depends on what your gang needs, uh, what your FC would like to see out of um, your fleet. I think running a tackler um, is a great way to learn the game. Um, what you can get, It quickly will teach you what you can engage, what you can't engage. Um, how to um, speed tank, how to occasionally, if, um, if you're running a, a tackler um, role, your FC will actually have you scout as well. It tends to be a synonymous role with smaller ships running around because they're really fast, really agile, can warp around quickly, and can move around the system quickly to have these smaller ships um, scout for gang as well. So it can put you in the position to have to scout, which is which would require you to learn very quickly um, a lot of the um, ways to um, gauge what's inside a system, who's there, what they're flying, how they're flying it. So I, I think frigates are viable. I think uh, Tech One Cruiser is viable. I think what's important is you look to play what you enjoy playing. You, you play what you want to play out of this game. Um, I mean, that said, if you decide to sub for this game to fly battleships, just understand it's going to take you a while to get um, the amount of SP with your character or the amount of money in this game to perhaps um, buy a character in the trading bazaar, something that's a character that's actually able to use said ship, and so a kind of an SP-intensive ship. This is why you have players suggesting to people if they want to try out PvP the first time, use these inexpensive and SP inexpensive um, ships. Okay, let's see. Elizabeth asks, I saw you were testing new frigates changes. However, I'm not a very experienced player. Sometimes it's hard to follow. What are your thoughts on the changes? I think the most important thing to say about the changes and what CCP's done to Tech 1 frigates is that they've now made um, their top tier frigate, their top tier combat frigates, even though they're trying to move away from the tier system, which is, <laughs> I guess it's going to be constantly a work in process, perhaps for years to come. But they're top tier combat frigates, viable against each other. Each one is good. It's no longer the Rifter is good. Everything else is okay. They're all they're all good in certain aspects. Um, what I was trying to do um, in that particular stream, one, I, I might try to link that particular recording for the class if they wanted to look at it. What I was trying to gauge was <laughs> whether or not the Rifter is actually viable for doing 1v1s at all in this new um, the new metagame that's going to become developing and establishing itself now that CSP's released this new patch. So um, I, I decided to do um, one versus one fights versus a friend of mine who's very good at frigate fights 
with these um, different races of frigates. And what I found that there, there are matchups. There, there are cl- clearly defined matchups where some ships are good at. They, they, they will excel, and sh- some ships are not. And it's, it's not that any one ship is the clear winner. Although I will say that Merlin is probably the overall best of the bunch. It, it, it does well in most categories. Um, each of these ships will have some things that are really good about them and some things that are not so good or um, okay about them. So what can, what can I say about that testing is that um, they're all competitive, which is, I think, a really, really, really good job on CCP's balance department. Props to them. Excellent. Yeah, you mentioned um, linking I guess you, you made a, um, a recording of that testing, and lately when I've been um, mentioning it to people, a lot of people have, have just been completely incredible. Just like the, you know, the changes to frigates, what, what the heck, this is brand new news to me. So, um, yeah, I think it might be up for people to um, to take a look at that video if you've done some you know real solid testing and you know, figuring out exactly what the changes mean and how that, that affects the, the whole... Um, Frigate versus frigate, or especially frigate versus rifter landscape. <laughs> I think the most important conclusion I can say about the testing is that the rifter is not the king of frigates anymore. Um, I think just about all the frigates, um, the, the the Punisher, the Incursus, the Merlin, can be very competitive and in fact dominate the rifter in many of its old formats, and that the rifter has to, the rifter pilot has to really work to adapt against the, the particular ships that's flying, and it actually has to fly the matchup now. It doesn't. It can't just use a generic fit, and it actually has to look at, okay, where are some creative ways for me to engage in Merlin or engage in Cursus? Um, how, how am I going to engage this brick tank of the Punisher that actually has really good damage up with now? So it's, it's no longer kind of a brainless approach of doing the same old thing. It's now something where a Rifter pilot has to... Um, really think about and actually change up its fitting for um, different targets, which is really cool to me. And uh, let me uh, post that. I think I... Yeah, just going back to try to make sure I don't miss anybody's questions. Uh, um, for those of you... I saw that a few people have joined the channel a little bit late. So for those of you who joined in a little bit late, this is the open Q&A with Sard Cade. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask him, feel free to just type them out in the lecture.euni chat channel. We're using lecture.euni. And prefix your question with a Q colon so that if I have to scroll back and look for questions like I'm doing right now, then hopefully I won't miss yours. And also, speaking about missing questions, if I if it does seem like I missed yours, feel free to just go ahead and type it out a second time. And my apologies in advance if I did miss it. Now, again, try to find out where I left off. It's Faye Toledo. Uh, thank you, Faye. Asks, do you share common advice to overheat modules before the start of the fight? What are your overheating strategies and gang fights? So it's a really contextual question. Um, it really depends on what kind of ship I'm flying, what the matchup is. If I'm in a gang, <laughs> wow, that's that's a really loaded question. But what I will say when I'm in a frigate fight, when I'm in a Tech 1 frigate fight, or usually Tech 2 frigate fights. The fights tend to last longer than your modules do when you're overheating. For ev- just about every single module. Like for your gun rack, it will, your guns tend to overheat longer than your, your ship will last. Your, I think the only module that might overheat and die is your um, your prop module, so be careful with that. But um, overheat all the things tends to be really good advice for when you're doing a frigate 1v1. Um, when you're looking at other ships... It really depends. Um, for example, if I'm fighting a drake, and I'm in a hurricane, or I'm in a harbinger, or I'm in another drake, um, I, I try to overheat my modules to break their peak shield recharge. Most drakes are going to be running in a, a buffer fit, so their shield recharge tends to be one of the most difficult aspects um, as far as their tank to take down. So you want to try to overheat your modules, or at least have some overheat um, left available to you when you hit their, um, their about 33% shields. Um, more recently, I had an incredibly good fight with the Starling of um, the Black Rebel Rifter Club and a um, Stiver Fleet issue 1v1. We're both in Stiver Fleet issues. And my overheat goal for that fight was to hold off on overheat 
until we were a couple minutes into the fight, until that his capacitor had some pressure of me damaging him. Um, and then once he was in perhaps half armor or so, kind of try to overheat, brawl down his tank, and overwhelm his tank. Because I, I, bl- I had a good idea that the Stabber Fleet issue matchup, both tanks could quite easily tank each other. So I wanted to hold back on my overheat and tank him and have his com- uh, capacitor be, uh, become very pressured before I, I um, try to overheat my guns. But um, and in gang fights, it, I think most FCs would tell you to apply overheat when they want you to. Um, apply overheat when, say, it's really critical to get tackle on a target. So apply overheat, say, on a, prop, a propulsion module and your tackle modules to get um, tackle on a target, keep up with the target. It might be important to apply overheat at very critical parts in a fight. Say if you're um, trying, there's a gang you uh, manage to um, get the jump on with a larger gang and they're trying to degress, your FC might ask you to start overheating your modules to take down the one or two targets that he believes he can take down with his fleet if they manage to get in a little bit extra DPS. Um, that said, I think it's really important in just about any size fleet engagement to understand a little bit about overheat management. One, it's a good idea to apply overheat. And that's just, I think something that pilots really need to get some experience on. And uh, again, you know, you're going to hear this quite often from any um, kind of veteran PvP or an EVE Online is that you just need to get out there and get that experience. I can't tell you when to overheat all in any given scenario. This is something you need to develop for yourself. Excellent advice. Uh, let's see. Gumby asks, are weapons more effective in a single large group or several smaller groups? I assume he means um, with grouping weapons on a, on a ship. Sure. Um, so, <laughs> I have to admit, I, with the missile changes, I just want to ungroup my torpedoes and just launch them like a second apart just so I can see like volleys of missiles just constantly hammer target. <laughs> but um, beyond being silly like that, um, there are, have your, your weapons in smaller groups. I think one of the most common reasons to do this is if you're running in an alpha ship, say an alpha battleship, like a Tempest or a Macarial. Sorry, no, well, Macarial works too, or a Maelstrom. Um, it's actually possible for you to have some of your guns, like not all of your guns, say four of eight of your guns on a Maelstrom, just one volley, just completely obliterate a cruiser and have um, your extra guns go on another target. So it can be actually be a really good idea to ungroup your guns. Um, you can get into a little bit more advanced things where some pilots will like to, say, in with missile ships or projectile ships, have smaller group guns and have different damage types associated with them. And while they're fighting, they will actually look at the damage that they're getting with their different um, ammo types, with their different damage types. And they will actually reload to change up their damage for optimal damage types. Do I think that's that's ideal for all but the most experienced and um, people here that are looking to get every single edge in their fight? Um, I don't think the majority of fights that any player here and the majority of any of their fights will really get a lot of out of trying to really pick their damage type like that um, actively. And I think the reason for that is the reload time you see on projectile weapons and on missile class weapons. You might see that being effective if you're in, say, an active tank ship versus active tank ship 1v1, say, an active tank battleship versus an active tank battleship, where the fight's going to last minutes anyway. It's just it's a good idea to have your optimal damage type from the start, so kind of testing your target from the start and reloading isn't as big of a deal as if you're doing kind of a more natural 1v1 where it's good to have just the proper assumption from the start and using your proper damage type from the start. But um, beyond kind of using um, alpha damage uh, weapons or kind of testing damage types, I can't think of a particularly good reason to spread out your um, weapons into smaller groups. Personally, I tend to do it just because I'm using different meta tier weapons. So I'll, I might have, say, on a ham drake, um, five tech two hams to use my specialization skill, the bonus that I get from it, and then perhaps a couple of meta 
heavy assault missiles because, for fitting reasons. Um, I can't really think of a better reason than those two I get, just gave. Okay, Texacol asks, how... Oh, any special recommendation about augmentations for PvP, CPU slash capacitor versus weapon upgrades? Augmentations. Um, Texcal, can you quickly state if you're return, referring to, say, hard wirings, um, implants? Let's see if we can get that um, in the chat. I'm assuming that's what it means. Implants. Um, gosh, uh, anything that's cheap, if you're cheap if you got more risk um you know put it in your head (laughs) i guess it really depends on where you're flying if you're expecting to lose your pod you know fly what you can afford to lose so i i I think that really applies to your pod as well just i I don't recommend for people to kind of take the garment approach of you know it take a fight in the moment you see like say a bubbler and null sec eject from your ship and get the hell out i (laughs) i really don't find that it as enjoyable as, I guess, the fights that he, he normally gets. Um, in low sec and high sec, I think it's pretty safe, as long as you have a decent connection for you to pimp your head, and um, once your ship explodes, you're gonna be, you should be able to spam warp to a, a celestial a, a location off-grid and get out. Um, I've, I've, I don't lose many pods. I don't lose many pods in null sec, even. So um, I think what you can afford to use um, is the most important thing I can say. What I use, um, well, I, I tend to use the... Well, heck, look, let me look at my head right now. I have a Zor's Custom Navigation Hyperlink. This is um, a implant that you won't see on market. You'll only see it on uh, contracts. It's a pretty cheap one. And what this one will do is actually increase the speed boost of an afterburner or a micro-warp drive by 5%, and it costs about 10 to 15 mil um, per implant. It's pretty it's pretty much a steal, in my opinion. I, a lot of my PvP focuses on using uh, my range advantage or controlling range. So I think that's a really useful um, implant to have that's really cheap. Beyond that, in the past, I tended to use a... Um, slot 10 implant called the Xanu Gnome Weapons Upgrades. It's um, W-1003. What this guy will do is actually decrease the CPU need of turrets by 3%. You can get this thing for like a mil or less. It's super, super cheap, which is why I stuck in all my um, my clones in the past. And it makes fittings a lot easier. In the past, I had a couple of fittings that really required it. But um, more recently, I haven't really been hardwiring um, intent. I've been flying around with the naked clones. Um, I think the, the biggest reason for that is just because I have about a, 106 or so million SP. I don't have much to train. I don't have much reason for to put in the attribute implants anymore. Um, and similarly, um, I, I just try to fly inexpensive, and I try to fly in a, in a method that a lot of people can replicate. So, I mean, if, if you can put in those hard wiring, if, if you find yourself in a particular class of ship or a particular style of PvP, you know, do it. It, it helps, especially if you're flying in an area of space where um, you're going to be able to retain that advantage over time and get your money's worth. Okay, Iliani asks, I often hear a lot of pilots choosing EM damage to the resist hole and shields or therm, as a lot of players don't plug that hole. What damage type do you use as inflicting on your foe? Um, if I have the option, um, and I, I don't know what the hell I'm going to be flying against, I, I tend to go with thermal. Um, I, I agree with that assertion that thermal is something that people don't plug. It tends to be a really good damage type against armor and shield tanks. Um, but if I can, um, I, I try to apply a little bit of what I call defensive PP and um, kind of draw out the, the engagement either while while I'm engaged with someone or before I even get the fight and try to get a, an idea of what kind of fit my opponent is um, actually flying. Um, but yeah, again, that said, I, I tend to uh, stick with thermal as the basic damage type that I'm going to be using. Or in, in the case of going up against, say, Tech 1 ships, it very well may be if I'm going if I know I'm going up against armor ship, hey, use explosive. If I know I'm going up against a shield ship, hey, use it EMP. If I'm going up against ships that I know are going to be plugging those holes, hey, use something that's not that particular damage type. 
So really contextual, but um, yeah, you're going to see me with phase plasma a lot when I'm flying my Minotaur ships. And Iliani also asks, um, brawling is a term I hear a lot regarding PvP, but it is really hard to actually d find a definition of what this style of combat is. Would you be willing to explain what brawling means to you? So what I feel brawling means is that you want to get right next to your opponent and shoot his ship. So that tends to mean that you're going to be using close-range weapons. It tends to mean you're going to be using maybe a little bit of gank modules, maybe a little bit of damage modules, a little bit of tank to kind of survive that encounter. You're going to be using modules to get yourself in range of that combat. And you're going to be flying um, in such a manner to get yourself into those sort, sort of inf um, those sort of engagements. So brawling is getting right next to the opponent and then blowing them up. So Galente tends to do really well here. Um, Amar tends to do decent here. They tend to be able, they they don't tend to be ships that are incredibly fast. So they tend to be ships that have to dedicate themselves to a fight once they choose to fight. So they tend to be good brawlers. They tend to have high tanks and high damage output. Kaldari has a couple ships that are okay at brawling. You know, the Drake, the Roke, those are really good ones. The Ferox is a close range, kind of a close range brawler. They also are known for a lot more of their um, kind of like fire support, long range stuff. Uh, Amar is also known for that. And uh, yeah, but brawling is, again, just that close range, you know, like high, a lot of trading going on. There's a lot of give and take going on. Give and take being um, both sides are putting out a lot of damage output. It's not so much relying on E War, it's more relying on just raw damage output and tank to uh, win a fight. Let's see, Ranger Phoenix asks, how do you determine how much ammo to carry so that you don't have too much should your ship be destroyed? That's a fantastic question. Uh, I've, I've killed so many people that have like 30 minutes worth of ammo in their cargo hold and I'm just laughing at them restocking my hangar for a particular uh, ammo type. Um, what I try to do is I try to think about what I'm, what I'm going to be doing with the ship. So it's my, my goal to get into a fight kill something and die immediately? Am, am, am I actually going to survive long enough to be able to reload my weapons? Do I think I'm going to get into an engagement where I'm going to have to change out my damage type? Do I, do I think I'm going to be using some, um, some of my long-range ammo if I'm using Tech 2 guns? Maybe I'm going to be using Null versus Antimatter or Void? It, so it really depends on my goal with a fight and how I'm going to be flying a ship. Um, also depends on the type of tank that I'm going to be running. Am I going to be something where I'm going to be recovering and lasting long duration? Am I going to be using a ship that's just has a high tank and it's going to be able to run through a lot of ammo? Am I using a uh, weapons that just run through a hell of a lot of ammo anyway? Um, or am I using a ship that just has very little cargo hold, so I just really need to cherry pick my ammo and how much I actually have in it, like a cyclone that's going to be using a lot of cap charges to fuel its tank? So what I tend to do is, um, after that's kind of decided, okay, how am I going to fly the ship, what kind of um, ammo, what types of ammo I think I really need, I tend to think about how long, is do, my, how long do my ships actually last in combat. Um, and this is something you just need to kind of figure out. Um, like, how long do your, your frigates or your cruisers last? Uh, if you're in a gang, how long does it take for you to get blown up? What kind of role are you flying in the gang? And from there, I, I just try to figure out, okay, well, you know, best case scenario, I mean, how much ammo do I need? So, for example, when I'm flying around in one of my gank dominixes, which is, you know, a couple blasters, drones, and just a little bit of tank, a lot of gank, I'm, I actually don't have a reload for any of my damage types. I, I have void and antimatter and null, but I don't have a reload. I just have enough for a load of, weapon, oh, of ammo. Or, conversely, if I'm in a cyclone, I actually have enough for about half a reload. Um, and the, the way I came up with this is um, just how long my, my ships tend to last and how long, after firing that much ammo, how long is that? So with a Cyclone, I, I, I can get fights that last longer than five minutes. And um, for projectile ammo, I tend to take about seven or ten minutes worth of ammo. With my, um, let's say my Dominics, I have... Probably more about five minutes worth of ammo, just for a full load of ammo for the guns, because I feel obligated to fill the guns completely.
but my fights with the Dominics tend to last less than that. It doesn't have an active tank to it. It doesn't have any active rippers. It tends to kill what it needs to kill, or it dies. And when it kills what it needs to kill, it does that in less than five minutes. So that's kind of how I gauge that. Alrighty. Um, Apophis, or maybe Apophy, asks... I'm totally new and have no clue as to what to do in a war. I have a Merlin PvP fitted, and what is overheating do for you? Now, this sounds like a, a more um, university-specific question, but <laughs> do you have any, like, you know, just general advice for him as a, a Merlin pilot and who is, you know, fairly new? And in case you didn't know about it, we're, we're currently at war with um, Space Police right now, so he's probably asking about that. Well, um, perhaps this, I... I highly recommend um, talking to your peers. I highly recommend um, talking to your FC. Hey, FC, um, what do you need me to do with my frigate? Um, if you're just looking for kind of small game solo stuff, um, I recommend looking at community resources like Fail Heap Challenge for fittings and kind of get an idea of what the ship's capable of. Maybe playing around in Pypha and EFT or even in game and what you can actually put on the ship. Can like get an idea from your peers, um, kind of what you can expect, and um, perhaps forget one v ones. And again, for a new player that's looking at a forget one v one, overheat all the things is pretty good advice. Um, the only thing that I wouldn't really overheat is perhaps your tackle prop mods if you don't need the extra range on your tackle or you don't need the extra speed on your prop mod. But having your guns overheated from the start of the fight. Really good advice. You tend to kill your target or die before your your guns will be burnt out. <laughs> good advice there. Let's see. Sid Psycho asks, so any recommendations for using slave or crystal sets for small gang stuff or just save those for caps and null fleets? <laughs> I don't often take my part in plants and null sec, but maybe I'm a coward. But, um, I think I actually had a, um, a, um, a, a friend, uh, not so much a friend, but a um, a guy that flies quite often that that I fly against in, in the Molden Heath region asked me about a uh, gank Dominic fitting he was looking at, and uh, he was trying to compare this to. He usually takes out a, a Drake and just tries to pretty much get a kill against a king before he dies. So he's like, "Is this a really improvement? I mean, am I improving what I'm doing?" So when you're looking at kind of like pimping your ship or your implants, what what is that going to do for you? It really, it's, you know, I keep on saying this, but it's really contextual. For, so, the kind of example I like to use is, so you have a group of friends. Say that they like using battle cruisers, and they're doing really well what they're doing. So if they're doing really well, they're, they're going to be tempted to kind of upgrade what they're doing so they do what they do even better. So, kind of like using a local example of my corporation, Let's say they, they've done really well for a while and they've gotten some money back, so hey, let's upgrade our hurricanes to Macarials. You know, these this is everything that a shield gank king can do and like a zillion times better, right? It's going to be a lot harder to kill you. It does, a lot, does the job better in all aspects. So, you know, if, if, if you're doing well, if you, you don't think you're going to be losing your pot, um, and if you think you're going to really benefit from having the extra AP from HP from a slave set or the extra shield boost from a crystal set, do it. You know, you got the money, do it. It's just, it's, it's, just go by the old adage, don't fly what you can't, lo- afford, you, you can't lose, you, what you can afford to actually lose. Um, I don't really recommend taking stuff out of the null set, because even if you can afford to lose it, losing about half a bill worth of stuff tends to be kind of a really punch to the, um, the the wallet for any player. But um, I, I think pirate implants are really useful. Yeah, absolutely. They, they give you an edge that not many other players have going for them themselves. And if you're in a solo situation, having any edge on your opponent is incredibly useful to have. But um, do I think it's necessary for the small gang solo stuff? Nah. No. I mean, like, like I said, I like to fly naked clones. And Faye Delito asks, funding your PvP, what's your solution? So my, in my particular case, um, like I said, I, I ended up going for that um, uh, Power of Two um, second account. And what I had this account do was fly around in uh, high sec, put up a bunch of buy orders for um, 
minerals and do a lot of T1 production. And on the side, he um, will do a lot of buy orders and sell orders and just work the market a little bit. But I think about the majority of my ace making, maybe 75, 90%, depends on the time of the, the, time of the month, what I'm actually doing, what, I, what I've been doing. Um, I do a lot of market stuff and I do a lot of production stuff, and I, I find that works really well for me. Um, I'm good with spreadsheets. I'm good at looking at numbers. I'm good at analyzing a market situation. So that's my niche. Maybe that might not be good for you. Um, on the side, I um, I recommend to a lot of my corp, corp mates and to other players that level four missions are pretty damn good too, and they tend to be really low risk as well. You can do them in high sec. You just need. I, I, I highly recommend. I I just recommend so much to people. Don't take people's word. Run the numbers and do your research on um, whatever sort of PVE um, method you, you decide to take up to make money. PVE is, I, I think it's it's the best way to make money. I don't I don't I don't make a lot of money off of PVP, um, but I, I just recommend so much that you do, you just research what you're going to be doing and determine for yourself is this indeed a really good way to make money. Um, the the mission running I do I do it for the Rector Tribe. I I can make upwards of 250 to 350 mil plus an hour. Depends on the type of missions I get. When I'm blitzing, I, I do mission blitzing. When I decide to do that, I make a lot of a lot of money. I think I think most people consider that decent ISK hour uh, for the, the effort they put in. Um, but it, it it might not be what other people find find enjoyable. It there are people are going to make as much, if not more, doing other activities in the game. But you really need to kind of look around, kind of maybe search the forums, kind of Google stuff, uh, Eve search stuff, and ask your peers and de- determine what's fun for you. I, I have friends that do a lot of um, exploration sites, that do a lot of DED sites. They they probably make comparable scour, and they have a lot of fun doing it. They do a lot of PvP while they do it as well. So I, I you know I really commend them for doing it. Um, I have friends that do a lot of exploration sites that are not PvP or do incursions or do uh, FACOR missions. They make their risk and they, and they enjoy doing it. So I, I don't think any one solution is the best for all people. I think it, you should be doing what you enjoy doing and what's good for you and what's the most optimal for you. And as a side, I think if, I, I really do think if you have, you're in a good situation outside a game, for, for money, um, buying and selling Plex is a really competitive way to making money in this game. I mean, what I what I like to look at is okay. Well, if I'm going to be grinding for an hour, if I don't really enjoy that grind, how much money to actually make compared to what I'm doing in my job? And I think most people these days will compare, look at that comparison and, and just buy and sell a, a couple of Plex when they think about it. You know, the, the, you know the, it's just. It's it's something that they don't really like doing. The, the PVE grind in this game, I think, is something that most people players in this game would say that CSP needs to work on a little bit. So that's not something to be ashamed of. Let's see. Zendal asks, do you utilize cap boosters with any degree of regularity? And if so, how? Oh, gosh. I'd say most of my fits are using cap boosters. Um, a lot of the chips I fly are... Um, Battle cruisers and battleships, and for various reasons, they need a, a cap booster. Um, and I think with the new shield boosters in the game, I think this is a really good question too. The, the ancillary shield boosters, like, oh, well, how does this affect the game? So, this is a, the question that really um, focuses on the cap usage with your ship. So are you using sh- uh, guns that take cap? Are you using your propulsion module hell of a lot? Are you using an active tank? So um, I like to fly battlecruisers and battleships. Those are probably my two favorite classes in the game for flying around casually. Um, and I, got, I, I think they're very good at just getting really decent fights regardless of um, where I'm going. Um, as long as I, I fly smart, I can usually get a, a decent engagement. So, um, what is a cap booster doing for me? It's, um, well, it's, it's, it's not just a tank. I, let, me, let me put it this way. And this, I think this answers a lot of people that are looking at the insular boosters and considering whether this is a good idea for them to put on a ship. So, if I'm flying in, say, a, um, oh gosh, let's say I'm flying a cyclone. 
and um, I'm, I'm doing my thing. I, I, let's say I'm using my extra large shield booster cyclone. If you're not sure what that is, I recommend you just <laughs> watch a couple of my um, old videos on my uh, Twitch TV site. But um, so what what is this this cap do, booster doing for me? When well, when I'm in a brawl, when I'm taking a lot of damage and I'm I'm dealing a lot of damage, I'm in close range. I'm trading with a ship similar size or a couple of ships of smaller size are doing decent damage up, but the cap booster is primarily primarily feeding my tank. Given okay, that's that's true. If that's not the case, or if I'm in the situation where hey, I need to get the hell out of this fight, you know these guys are doing too much damage, or they have some friends coming in, or something like that. Or hey, there's a curse on field, or there's a there's a ship with an energy neutralizer on field. I I just I can't tank under this this uh, capacitor pressure. I need to get out. The cap booster is not just going to be fueling your tank. It might be fueling your tackle modules. It might be fueling your guns. It might be fueling your um your propulsion modules. The cap booster has a lot more utility than just eating your tank. It's really important to look at what you actually use your cap booster for. It might be possible that you're just using your cap booster under a lot of neutralizer press, uh, pressure to continue using your propulsion module and getting away from your opponents and eventually warping off. Say um, I jump in with my cyclone versus kind of a sizable camp. They don't have a lot of fast tackle, but they have a lot of damage output. I just need to get some range and get out of point range, get out, warp out. I can't tink that. I can't get back to gate with the their amount of damage output. You know, magnifies if I get close to them. But if I get away from them and I warp out, you know, I might be able to get out. So, um, cap boosters, even with these these new active tank modules, they're they're incredibly viable modules. They're they're really useful. It's it's not something you should eschew when looking at these really shiny, super good tanking ancillary um, shield boosters. There, there's more to the cap booster than just fuel, uh, fueling your tank. So, I guess getting more to the basis of the question, I, um, I use them mostly on active tanks. Um, I use them occasionally on ships that have Guns that require capacitors. So, for example, on my gank mix, I don't have an active repping module on there, but I do have guns that require a lot of capacitor, and I have a micro warp drive on my gank mix. So, there's a lot of modules that are really cap hungry on there, and I want to be um, effective in case I'm under some new press pressure, or and if I had to run my micro warp drive for a long, long time, I want to have some way to some um, quick and easy capacitor, and um, a cap booster is a way to. Let's see, Lou Dog asks, are boosters useful enough to bother using? I'm assuming he means drug boosters. Uh, I would assume that as well, and I would say absolutely. If you're able, I think that's something that a lot of pilots, especially pilots that have been in high sec for a long time and are worried about the legality issues associated with boosters, or kind of issued boosters for um, just kind of more standardized flying. Um, boosters are incredibly powerful. Um, even if you don't have a lot of uh, SP into the booster skills, even if you're not will- able to pay for some booster skills, I forgot which one it was, but I know at least one of them costs a hell of a lot of money, like over 100 mil is just to buy this one skill. 